Is God real? Are the stories in the Bible true? I need answers. Welcome to A Closer Look with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to spend the next hour with us as we delve into the study of God's Word. We can't do what we don't know. Here at Shiloh, we want to spend time studying the Word so that we can rightly apply the Word to our daily living and make a difference in our community and in our world for Jesus Christ. Won't you join us now for a closer look into God's Word? We are continuing our look at Hebrews. Uh, last week, we uh, wanted to get into Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, I felt like I didn't do a good job last week. I did what I typically do. I uh, spent so much time dealing with the prelude to what I wanted to talk about that when I got to what I wanted to talk about, I was rushing through it trying to get to the end uh, of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, you don't have to agree with me so much. I, I, I know what I did. <laughs> but um, we decided to go back and look at Hebrews chapter 11 with a little bit more uh, intentionality, with a little bit more uh, 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 precision about what it is that we wanted to talk about. Part of the reason why I felt like I could breeze through this is because this is perhaps the most famous passage in Hebrews. If, if you don't know anything else about Hebrews, most people know now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, which is how Hebrews chapter 11 begins. Right behind that, uh, we know uh, what is said at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, where we're told to look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. What we wanted to do last week, and not to rehearse it all again, was look at the passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 10 that led into the discussion of faith to help us to understand the context in which it is given. Uh, one of the things that's important in any Bible study period, and, and we've been in Hebrews now for uh, several weeks, and this is true with any book that you do, uh, that, that, that you give an, a, a, an extended study to, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it an exegesis, uh, but that you give an extended study to, it's important that you keep the passages in context. One of the worst things that happens uh, within the church setting uh, is that we pull passages out of their context and prop them up and try to make them mean what we want it to mean rather than what the passage actually seeks to convey. Passages are given within a context. And if we are to have any appreciation of what the writer was intending to say, it's important that we spend time dealing with the context. Let, 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 let me give you a simple example of what I'm talking about. If you and a friend were talking and you've been engaged in a 10 to 15 minute conversation and somebody comes by as you are talking and they overhear one or two sentences of a 10 to 15 minute conversation and they run with that one or two sentence uh, 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 portion that they heard and go and share with others, what is the likelihood that you're not going to get, that, that the people to whom they share this information are not going to get the appropriate understanding, meaning of what was being said? The likelihood is very high because you can't pull one sentence out of a 10 minute conversation and uh, have a full appreciation of the context in which something is said, what information is sought to be conveyed. Well, unfortunately, we do this in the church 
all the time. Pastors do it. Sunday school teachers do it. Bible study teachers do it. We don't do it always with, with, with malice. We don't do it always uh, with uh, some kind of devious intention, but we do it all the time. We do it on Sunday morning. Uh, one of the reasons why I try to preach texts and give context to the text is because you can't preach the whole passage. Now, unless I, I'm not a one hour preacher. I know y'all know people who preach for an hour. I'm, I'm not one of those kinds of preachers. I'm, I'm a 20 to 25 minute preacher. If I'm mad about something, I might stay with it for 30 minutes. But, 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 but that, that, that's, that's the kind of preaching that I do. Well, if you're doing a 20 minute message on a particular passage, you have to do a whole lot of explaining of the context in which the passage was given in order to help people understand the points that you are trying to leave with them uh, for their remembrance from the passage that you are preaching. Too often, we just pull a passage out, uh, the the, the ones who are most sinister about this, the ones who are most devious about this are ones who don't really preach the passage, but preach what they want to preach and then try to find a passage that fits what they want to say. Now, now that's a whole other level of deviousness, and it happens all the time. So, so, so we have to always be on guard and understand that, that there is a context in which a passage is given. We know now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And a few of us know some of the verses that come behind it. But how many of us connect what came before it, which is what we tried to do last week? Quite often, because of the way Scripture is subdivided, because uh, Hebrews 11 and 1 is the beginning of the chapter, we don't necessarily think that what was in the previous chapter has anything to do with Hebrews 11 and 1. But when you read it within its context, when you start with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, and read from there on through Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and those verses that follow, you can see very clearly that there is a context involved, that, that, that the point that is being made uh, has to do with living the faith that you say you uh, are, are, are a part of. Uh, the writer of Hebrews wrote in order to encourage these Jewish Christians or these Christians of Jewish background to stay the course in spite of the suffering that they were going to endure. And he does so by employing the, the, the zeal that they had when they first came into their knowledge of Christ. Remember, here I go reading it again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Remember those early days after you first saw the light. Those were the hard times, kicked around in public, targets of every kind of abuse. Some days it was you, other days your friends. If some friends went to prison, you stuck by them. If some enemies broke in and seized your goods, you let them go with a smile, knowing they couldn't touch your real treasure. Nothing they did bothered you. Nothing set you back. So don't throw it all away now. You were sure of yourselves then. It's still a sure thing. But you need to stick it out, staying with God's plan, so you'll be there for the promised completion. And then from there, he says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You see, when, when, when he says that, the, the conjunctive now connects what comes behind it with what was there before it. And what was there before it was an encouragement 
to remember and, 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 and relive the zeal and the excitement and the, the depth of commitment that you had when you first came into knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't let that slip away from you. Don't let your enthusiasm for Christ be lost. Don't let your excitement for your relationship with God wane in any way because you are experiencing hard times. If anything, deepen your commitment. Don't let it be lost. And so he says that in order to lead them to understanding what faith is. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, when he talks about the ancients being commended, then he starts into a litany of who the ancients were. It is not an exhaustive list. In fact, at some point he sounds like a preacher getting ready to wrap up a sermon. He says, I, 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 I've run out of time. I can't spend but so much more time with this. You know how we preachers do. I, I can't preach the whole text, so let, let me get ready to, to close right here. That's what he sounds like. But before he gets to the point that he, he, he closes this portion of his message, he gives us ample examples of those who had lived by faith. And then he says something at the end about those who had lived by faith. First thing he talks about is the creation. He says, we know that it was by faith, or, or by faith we know, let me, let me be clear, not we know by faith. We, by faith we know that the universe was formed by God's Command. He's not saying that God did it by faith. He's saying we know that God did it by our faith in God so that what is seen is made out of what is invisible. And then he says, uh, by an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. Now he starts to call the role of certain people. He starts with Abel and Cain. Interesting, he doesn't start with Adam and Eve, but he starts with Abel and Cain. Why does he start with Abel and Cain? Because Abel and Cain is where the first murder takes place. Abel and Cain is, is where the first uh, uh, wholesale rejection, I, I know you're going to say, well, uh, Adam and Eve rebelled against God too. Yes, they did. But, but this was a blatant rebellion against the word of God where Cain killed his brother. It was what he believed, not what he brought that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Enoch, but what we do know about Enoch is that he walked so closely with God that at some point, he simply was not. He was translated. The Bible doesn't record that Enoch died. The Bible simply translated that God took him. He was so close to God that at some point, God just took him. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. I'm getting to verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. All right, so he talks about what faith is. Based upon what you're going through, he calls upon his readers, his hearers, uh, to deepen their faith commitment, to renew their faith commitment. If I can use this term, to, to, to be revived in their faith commitment to uh, the Lord. And then he tells them what that faith should look like, that, that it involves a belief in that which you cannot see. It, 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 it does not require and cannot be uh, 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 limited to tangible evidence. It must go beyond that. Let's, let, let, let's park there for a minute. 
The need to understand that our faith in God must go beyond tangible, must go beyond the tactile, must go beyond the things that we can see or that we can taste or that we can smell or that we can hear or that, that, that we can touch, the, the, the five senses that we have, that, that, that our faith in God must exceed that. Because if our faith in God is predicated upon just what we can see, then the faith itself is limited. It does not mean that we should reject what we see from God. It does not mean that what we see from God in his creation, in his activity with men and women, in his activity with nations uh, is, is, is something that we should ignore or overlook. It simply says that we should not be limited to that. I say that because we talk about what we see all the time. M much of what we talk about with our faith has to do with what we see or with what we experience. I was sick. I prayed to God. I got better. My faith was renewed. Someone got in trouble. I sought the Lord and the Lord brought them out of the trouble that they were in. Our faith is renewed. So, much of what we say about faith, about our, 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 our faith in God, is predicated upon what the Lord has done for us. What is, what's that song we sing? You don't know what he's done for me, gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Well, let me ask you the question. If you didn't do anything, would you still love him? If you prayed for somebody who was sick and they died, would you still love them? If you, pray, if, if you sought the Lord to bring relief to your pain or someone else's pain, and yet the pain persisted, would you still love him? This is why you can't be limited in your faith experience with, with God just to your experience because while all of us can can highlight positive wonderful experiences that we've had with God we must also acknowledge that there have been some experiences with God that ain't so wonderful there have been things that have happened with God that that that, that left us I think I said this last week left us not just hurt not just devastated but angry and, and I know for many of us, we don't believe that we have a right to be angry with God. And perhaps from, from, from a purely theological perspective, you're right. We don't have a right to be angry with God. But we get angry with God anyway. Or am I the only one? There are things that God does. There are things that God allows. There are things that God permits. There are things that I seek God for, and I don't get what it is that I seek God for. And sometimes it leaves me angry. Often it leaves me disappointed. Sometimes it leaves me frustrated. Sometimes it leaves me bewildered. But beyond bewildered and frustrated and disappointed, sometimes it leaves me angry. Now, what do you do with that? What you do is you learn how to trust God in spite of your anger. You learn that your faith is not limited to only having positive feelings about the Lord. Let me, let me bring it to an earthly level since, since y'all ain't going to go with me with getting mad with God. Let, let, let me bring it to an earthly level. You ever get mad with your parents when you were a child your mama or your daddy your grandmother wh whoever raised you you, you you ever get mad with them you, you ever and, and if you have a certain generation you would never do this you ever feel like saying something to them <clears throat> yeah now, 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 now I, I, I know that if you're of a certain generation you never would 
But don't tell me you ain't never feel like it. Don't, don't tell me it never crossed your mind. Don't, some of y'all might have even mumbled a little something under your breath and then had them say, did you say something? No, 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 I, I didn't say anything. I, I didn't say anything at all. The fact that, 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 that your parents said things, did things, uh, caused you to do things that left you angry with them. Did it change the fact that you loved them? No. You loved them. You trusted them. You, 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 you still had a deep abiding commitment to them. It's just that in this instance, about this circumstance, you got angry. And maybe you stayed angry. Maybe you're still angry. Depends on how good your memory is. You might still be angry about some stuff that happened. Made you do stuff that you didn't want to do. Made you go places that you didn't want to go. Stuff like that. But it does not change the fact that you were still committed to your parents. It does not change the fact that you were still committed to Big Mom or Big Daddy or whoever it was who raised you. Well, just like you get angry with your parents, your grandparents, your, 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 your guardian, the one who raised you, you get angry with God. It's just that you were taught you can't, you can't say nothing about it. You, you can't do anything about it. You, you were taught that you didn't have the right to be angry. Let me help you out with something. You can be angry with God. It's okay to be angry with God. Just watch how you express your anger. God allows us to be angry with him. And, 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 and since most of us pride ourselves on our personal integrity, on our honesty, if we're angry, why would you be dishonest and say, I'm not angry? But it's a matter of how the anger is expressed. It's a matter of being respectful. Jesus uh, went to Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house for dinner. This was not, the, this was not after Lazarus was dead. The, the, this was while Lazarus was still alive and Jesus was invited to their house for dinner. And while uh, they were preparing for dinner, while, while Martha was preparing for dinner, uh, the scripture says that Mary and Lazarus were sitting near Jesus. Mary was actually sitting at his feet, listening to Jesus talk. And Martha got mad about it. Martha uh, passing back and forth, you, you, know, you know, going from the kitchen to the dining room and, and, and you, you, you're doing all the, the moving around. You're putting everything where it needs to be. And every time you look up, Mary's down there next to Jesus and she ain't helping him do anything. And I'm doing all this by myself. And finally, Martha says to Jesus, Master, make her get up from there and help me. Now, it sounds like she's mad with Mary, and she was. But she was more than mad with Mary. She was mad with Jesus. See, th th there's what you say, and there's what you mean, but you don't say. She said, make Mary get up and come help me. What she meant was, how dare you let Mary sit down here while you watching me walk back and forth, setting all this stuff up, and you won't do anything about it. You know she'd get up from there if you told her to get up from there. You obviously don't care about what I'm trying to do because you letting her sit there instead of telling her to come help me. Martha wasn't just mad with Mary. Martha was mad with Jesus. Jesus doesn't rebuke Martha. I'm, I'm getting to the point that God will let you be angry with. Jesus doesn't rebuke Martha. What Jesus says to Martha is actually very compassionate. He says, 
you have chosen a good thing. You, you, you're doing a good thing. He commends her for what she is doing. But then he adds this, but Mary has chosen something better. And I'm not going to take from Mary what she has chosen in order to make you happy. God doesn't get mad with us because we get mad with him. We just have to be careful about how we express our anger. If, if, if your loved one is sick and they die, don't tell me you're going to be happy about it. No, you're not. You, 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 you find ways to resolve it. You find ways to deal with it, to cope with it, but you ain't happy about it. My mother died in 1986, April 2nd, 1986. She, she, she had been suffering uh, with cancer for about five months. Uh, she, she, she discovered the cancer in September of 85. Uh, she had her left breast removed in November of that same year. We were told that she was terminal the 1st of December of that year, and she died the first uh, couple of days of April of the following year. Now, I consoled myself with the fact that she was no longer suffering because before she died, she was in agony. She, she, she was in an awful lot of pain and, and, and pain was taking its toll on her. Eventually, she stopped talking to people. People would come by and they'd try to talk to her and, and, and she would literally turn away. She did not want that. She, she, it, the, the pain was becoming too intense. And I, I'll never forget, I, I was still in seminary, in my last year of seminary, and I went by to see her before I headed back to New Orleans and she turned her face to the wall. She would not even look at me. She would not hear anything that I had to say. And I walked out of that hospital room with tears in my eyes and I prayed to God, please take her because she's in terrible pain. Well, that was on a Monday night, early Wednesday morning before uh, the sun came up. My father called and told me that my mother had passed. Uh, now, there's a part of me that says, I'm glad because she's no longer in pain. But there was another part of me that got mad that a 55-year-old woman at the time, she discovered the cancer and lost her breast, was terminally ill. I got mad that she spent the last several months of her life going back and forth to doctor's offices and, and radiation therapy and, and all of them. I got mad because her beautiful hair fell off of her head as a result of, of, of the treatment that she received. I got mad that her body swelled up from the steroids that they were giving her trying to mitigate her pain. I consoled myself with the fact that she was no longer in pain, but consoling myself did not in any way, shape, or form take away the anger that I felt at God. I, I wasn't angry at the doctors. I wasn't angry at the nurses. I was angry with God because he let my mother die. 15 days after her 56th birthday. It's a terrible feeling. And, and, and I don't think that I'm the only person who's ever been angry with God about what God has done, about what God has allowed, about what God has permitted. And, and my faith tells me that everything, see, see y'all want to put everything on the devil. The devil did this or the devil. Have you read your Bible? Do you know that the devil has no control? We say that God is omnipotent. 
Do you know what omnipotent means? All powerful. That there is no power greater than God. Well, if God is omnipotent, if God has all power, then what power does the devil have that supersedes God's power? The answer is none. So I wasn't mad with the devil. I was mad with God. Because God allowed this. To, now, here's the thing. God ain't asked me my opinion about nothing. God didn't come to me in the middle of the night and say, what do you think I should do? And here's the, here's the better thing for me. Even though I got mad with God about what happened, and when I think about it, I still get mad with God about what happened. It has not in any way caused me to walk away from the faith that I have in God. The absolute rock solid trust that I have with God that even when things happen that I don't like, that I don't think are fair, that I don't think are right, I still believe that God's way is a better way. And it gives an entirely new meaning to me when I read what Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's where I am with God. That's not the only thing that's happened in my life that, that, that has made me mad with God. Other things have happened as well. But what I have learned is I'll get over my anger. But I ain't going nowhere. I ain't leaving him. I ain't quitting. I, I, I ain't going to pull a Jeremiah. I ain't going to say I quit. I'm going home. I ain't going to preach no more. I ain't going to serve no more. And guess what? Jeremiah said all of that and ended up right back where he was because he said it was like a fire shut up in his bones. And he found that he had to do it. My point is this our faith calls us to accept the sovereignty of God even as we go through our difficult times faith without faith verse 6 says it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, what is that reward talking about? Some people think that that reward has to do with heaven. Well, if you think that, you're mistaken because you don't earn heaven. Nobody earns heaven. Heaven is yours by the gift of of God through Jesus Christ. So when he says he rewards those who earnestly seek him, he can't be talking about heaven. What he's talking about is the companionship of his presence while you're going through hell here on earth. keep things in its context go back to, to to chapter 10 remember those early days after you first saw the light those were the hard times kicked around in public targets of every kind of abuse now read what he says in verse 6 he we must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him Seek him for what? Seek him for relief from the suffering that I'm enduring. He's writing to Christians who are suffering because they're Christians. Not suffering because they did some wrong, not suffering because they committed some crime, suffering because they made the choice to embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord. So when he talks about faith, and the reward of faith, what he's saying is that the reward is his presence 
while you're going through hell. Everybody goes through hell. I don't care who you are. If you've lived more than a minute, everybody has gone through or is going through hell. What, what is it we like to say? Either you're in a storm, just coming out of a storm, or about to go into a storm. Everybody knows what it is to go through hell. And nobody with any sense likes going through hell. But the word from the writer of Hebrews to us is while you're going through hell, it's so much better if there's someone with you as you pass through. You must believe that he, that he, that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently, faithfully, consistently seek him. The reward is his presence. What is it that Jesus says to us? I am with you always, even to the end of the world. What is it that Jesus says to us? In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What is it that God says to Joshua? I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. The promise of Scripture, forget what these crazy folk are saying in these uh, 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 worship centers about being isolated and insulated from suffering. Show it to me in the Bible. It's not there. The promise is not that you will be estranged from suffering. The promise is that you'll have a companion with you as you go through your suffering. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise. If you're born into this world, you're going to die. And death is a painful experience. But for those who are left behind, I will not leave you nor forsake you. 60% of all marriages in this country fail. 60% of all marriages in this country fail. If you've ever gone through a divorce, as I have, it's a painful experience. The promise is not that you won't have pain. The promise is that there'll be a companion with you as you go through your pain. As you go through your divorce, as you go through all the shoo-shooing and the talking and, 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 and the back and forth, as you go through the fake folk who want to tell you, I'm praying for you. Sometimes those are the most impotent words in the world, the most empty words you can say because you know they, ain't, they don't mean it when they say it. But the promise is that God will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. Many of us have children who we raised in the church, but forgot all about the church. And, and, and you wondered, when, when is that verse going to kick in? That, that, that when you know, raise up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Okay, he's old now. He, he still ain't come back. To how, how much longer I got to wait before he comes back. Many people stay up walking the floor wondering where their child is or if their child is going to come home. The promise is not that you won't have hell. The promise is that he will be with you. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. The promise is his companionship as you're waiting on your child to come home. Somebody is getting a pink slip on Friday. And they're going to say thank you for your service. They ain't going to even give you a gold watch. They're just going to say thank you and goodbye. And you're going to wonder how you're going to make it. The promise is not that you won't go through hell. The promise is that you have a companion with you who will help carry you through hell. I can make this list endless. You Live in this world. 
you're going to catch hell. And all this foolish talk about if you do this and if you do that, then, then, then you can avoid. Have you ever known people who did all the right stuff and yet wrong stuff happened to them anyway? Go back to Job. What is it that Job did that caused him to lose everything? The answer is nothing. Read the text. Satan comes to God and says, you know, I, I, I've been around seeing who I could get. And God said that you haven't taken into consideration Job. Ain't nobody as good as Job. Job, Job, Job. Job's the best one I got out there. And the devil said he's good because you built a hedge around him. Let that hedge down a little bit and, and, and let's see how good he really is. Now you tell me, what did Job do to cause the hedge to be lowered? Not a thing. The hedge was lowered. Satan touched his, his wealth and his, his crops and his livestock and his children. And Job gave a good answer. Naked I came into the world, and naked I shall leave. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Satan goes back to God. And Satan says, you let me touch his body. You see, the problem is you lowered the hedge, but you didn't, you didn't lower it enough. Lower the hedge a little bit more. Let, 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 let me get into his body. And then let's see what happens. I ask again, what did Job do to cause the hell that he was experiencing? And then the next thing you read is not just that his body has broken out in sores and he has to leave his house and sit in sackcloth and ashes, but in addition to the physical suffering, he suffers the mental and emotional torment of being abandoned and being ridiculed by people who he thought loved him. Mrs. Job comes to him in sackcloth and ashes and say, you still clinging to your integrity? You still holding on to your faith in God? I don't know. If I was you, I'd curse God and die. I ask you, what did Job do to bring all of this about? Three friends come by, Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz, and, and, and they sit around and they take turns taking jabs at Job. Had to have done something for, 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 this, for this to be going on. You, you must have done something, Job, and you need to confess what it is you have done. I ask you, what is it that Job did that caused this to happen in his life? And I, I, I bring this point up because I'm, I'm not saying that I'm Job. I'm not saying that anybody in here is Job. But I'm saying that all of us know of people who have suffered terribly and they didn't do anything to cause the suffering. You know, we live in a world where, where we believe everything is cause and effect. If something happens, then, 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 then you must have done something to make it happen. That's logical. But I learned a long time ago, what's logical is not always true. And what's true ain't always logical. You read Job's story, and you tell me what Job, it wasn't until Job had suffered all of the mounting stuff on him that he finally begins to turn a, 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 a look of, a, a, of anger towards God. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I would plead my case. But even at that, he was talking about not going away from God, but running to God. Ain't that what we're supposed to do? When we get in trouble, ain't God the one we're supposed to run to? 
When we feel despair, when we feel lost, when we feel isolated, when we feel hurt, isn't that what we tell everybody to do? Run to God? So even when Job was getting mad with God, he was talking about running to him, not running away from him. Job's a pretty good fellow. And yet, Job had problems. I ain't as good as Job. I freely admit it. I'm not as good as Job. I've had problems. But my problems are made better because I know that I've never been by myself. I've never been to a place where God was not there with me. We talk about going to, to, to meet him in the air, going, going to see him on the other side. And, and, and believe me, I want to see him on the other side. But I ain't got to get to the other side to know that he's with me because he's with me right now. He walks with me right now. He talks with me right now. He builds a hedge of protection around me right now. He makes a way for me out of no way right I don't need to get to heaven for that to happen. It's happening right now. Those who have faith must believe first that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him and the reward is his presence. Bible tells the story in Daniel chapter three of three young men, we call them boys, Hebrew boys, three, th three young men in their 20s around the time that this happened who uh, were, were, were told that they had to bow down to an idol, an, an image of King Nebuchadnezzar, or else they would face uh, being terminated, being, being put to death, being executed by fire, being, being placed into a fiery furnace, and they would not bow. They, 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 Simp they, they didn't make a whole lot of noise about it until the noise was brought to them. The word went out that this is what they must do. And everybody in the land did what they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it, except these three. They wouldn't do it. And word got back to Nebuchadnezzar that they wouldn't do it. And so Nebuchadnezzar brought them in. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, I've been good to you boys. I've, tr I've treated y'all fine. I I've given y'all positions within my uh, uh, monarchy within my administration you hold offices so so I'm gonna just assume that you didn't understand the, 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 the edict that went out so so I'm gonna tell it to you plain when you hear the orchestra play you need to bow down to that image that was put up everybody understands now you, you got it straight N nobody has any questions and they responded no we ain't got no questions but I can tell you this, we ain't gonna bow. In fact, they got kind of arrogant about it. They said, we don't even have to go back and think. We don't have to huddle up about it. We don't need to sleep on it. We, 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 we don't need to have a private discussion about it. I can, I can speak for the group and I can say, you can play all the music you wanna play. We will not bow down. King got angry. Nebuchadnezzar got angry and, and he throws them into this furnace and, and the scripture says that the furnace was heated seven times hotter and, and I don't know if seven was the actual number or if they were trying to make a point because seven is a number of perfection and so when, when you say it was heated seven times hotter it meant that it was it was heated exponentially hotter than it had ever been heated before. It was heated so so much it, it was so hot that the ones who were standing guard around the furnace died from exposure to the heat and they were bound and they were thrown into the furnace 
somehow or other, there had to be a, a, a hole in there. We, we like to say it was a window, but a window implies glass. I don't know whether there was glass or not, but there was a hole in there that allowed them to see what was going on. And, and Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace. And then he looks back at his administrative crew. And then he looks into the furnace again, and then he looks back at his administrative crew. And he asks a question. Didn't we put three in there? It was three, right? We, I mean, I know I got mad, so, so it might have been, but, but clarify, we put three in, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, well, you put three in. Why do I see four? Didn't you tell them to tie their hands and bind them before you put them in? Oh yeah, 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 we, we, we bound them before. I don't see any ties. I don't see any ties on their hands. I don't see any ties on their feet. And I don't hear no hollering. And I don't hear no screaming. I don't hear no cries of agony. In fact, what I see is they're loose and walking around. And I recognize three of them. I recognize Shadrach. And I recognize Meshach. And I recognize Abednego. But there's another one in there. And the best way I can describe him is to say he looks like the son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar had them brought out and he got close enough to him to where he could smell them. And the scripture records there wasn't even the smell of smoke on their person or on their clothing. And Nebuchadnezzar had to fall. He wanted them to bow, but he had to fall on his knees. And he had to acknowledge that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is God. Now, I said all of that to say this. When you go through hell, The promise is not that, you, that, 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 that somehow or other you're going to escape hell. The promise is you're not going through hell by yourself. The boys were so bold that they said, we believe that God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, but if he doesn't, but if we die, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But if we die, we still will not bow. Faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him with his presence. That's the reward, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, the rest of Hebrews 11, as, as we said last week, deals with various aspects of of, of, of Jewish history. He talks about Cain and Abel. He talks about uh, Enoch. He talks about 
Abraham and he talks about Sarah and he talks about Isaac and he talks about Jacob and he talks about Joseph and then he gets to the end and this is why I say he's like a preacher who's trying to wrap up a sermon turn with me to verse 32 of chapter 11 I could go on and on but I've run out of time ain't you heard a preacher say that before I'm running out of time there are so many more that I could list Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets I could go into detail but 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 I've used up all my 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 time talking about what I what I've been talking about but let me just end by telling you this through acts of faith they toppled kingdoms they made justice work they took the promises for themselves they were protected from lions fires and sword thrusts they turned disadvantage to advantage they won battles they routed alien armies I, I can hear him tuning up as he as he gets to this women receive their loved ones back from the dead there were those who under torture refused to give in and and go free preferring something better resurrection now when he says that let me be clear because I'm running out I got I got four minutes when he says they preferred something better resurrection he's not talking about their resurrection because there's only been one resurrection and that's Jesus. Now, I, I know somebody has taught you that, that you're going to be resurrected one day. Well, if that's your belief, that's fine. My belief is absence from the body means presence with the Lord. When Jesus talked to the thief on the cross, he didn't say one day you'll be with me in paradise. He said this day you'll be with me in paradise. There ain't but one resurrection. And that's Jesus. And when he says they, 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 they preferred something better, resurrection, he's talking about the resurrection of Christ because it is the resurrection of Christ that secures our salvation. You ain't got nothing without the resurrection. He says they, they, they preferred something better. Others abused braved abuse and whips and yes chains and dungeons we have stories of those who were stoned sawed in two murdered in cold blood stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins homeless friendless powerless the world didn't deserve them making their way as best they could on the cruel edges of the world not one of these people even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. What he says here is they died looking for something that never happened. And if that's not a good definition of what faith is, I don't know a better one. I'm so committed to Christ. I'm so trusting in Christ that I'll die before I reject Christ. Is that not what Stephen did? Bible says that, 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 that they grabbed hold of Stephen and, and, and they wanted him to, to stop proclaiming Christ and he wouldn't do it and they stoned him to death and as he was dying, he looked up and God allowed him to have a glimpse of heaven. It's, it, it's in Acts. He, he, he had a glimpse of heaven and he looked and he saw Jesus. He saw the throne of heaven and he saw God and he saw.